get started. All right. Um, yeah, sign the sign in sheet whenever you get a chance. So just reminders uh, in your my math lab, you have the orientation and you should have been working on the homework one already. Hopefully y'all finished it. Have y'all finished the homework one? Was it okay? This is all review material. Do I need to go over any of that material anymore with y'all? Or can we move on to section 1.1 1 .1 at the beginning of the book? 1.1? 1 .1? All right, we'll do that today. Now, I forgot to give y'all an exam at the end of class last time. All right, so y'all get full credit for that daily exam. But y'all can't let me forget today, all right? So that's, that's your in-class homework, just to remind me not to forget to give you the exam, right? Um, so start working on the 1.1 homework. And of course, you can always work ahead. You know, I recommend you work as far ahead as possible, right? You don't want to get behind, behind sucks, right? So um, let's see here, under files, um, there's these folders here daily. Let's see if I can go back to the file group here. So inside of daily quiz and exam solutions, I posted the solutions for the quiz for from last time, right? So if for some reason you happen to not be able to do an exam or quiz in time, you can always go here and look at the solutions and still upload your answers, but you'll only get half credit because the solution's already posted, all right? So again, I shouldn't see any zeros this semester, all right? Um, and the lecture notes are posted. This first uh, a file here, the calendar, uh, keep a close eye on that. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Here it is. So it has the, the schedule for us, right, that we're gonna be following. So let's see, what is today? The 24th. So, all right, we should be good. If today's, this is all wrong. The, again, the schedule here is for Monday, Wednesday, but we're Tuesday, Thursday. We just like guesstimate, right? Um, so we're on um, 1.1 here. So we're, we're pretty good as far as the schedule goes. Um, uh, so to start off the day, normally I'd work the exam from last time, but there wasn't one. So we'll start off with the, the daily quiz here. Um, it might be more challenging than the stuff in the book, but uh, again, we're gonna, you can work together on it, right? So if, you, if this is tough for you, just work with your classmates. And then after, I don't know, 10 minutes, uh, I'll work it with you, okay? So we'll take 10 minutes to do that. It's 3.03 at 3.13, we'll work this, I'll work it with you, okay? I'll just uh, call real quick. Uh, Jordan, where are you? I heard you. Hi, Jordan. Mark. Marty. Samantha. Samara. Julian. Gabriella. Laura. Still missing your exam one and quiz one. Okay, uh, because it's already been time, right? I've already uploaded. Wait, this is, I didn't post solutions for exam one. Quiz one. You having trouble uploading your answers? No, because I didn't see an upload for you. Is it daily quiz one and the daily exam one? Uh, uh, here in the assignments, there should be like, there's a section for daily quizzes, right? And I think you go there and it'll let you upload a file. And then same thing here under daily exam, unless I'm looking in the wrong spot. Right? Um, oh, what the exam was? All right, the quiz one is just, Tell me a little bit about yourself. That's it. Yeah. And the exam one is just tell me a little bit about what you like or dislike about math. 
is mainly for tech purposes to make sure y'all could all get your files submitted in the right format and all that stuff. So go ahead and get that in. You'll still get full credit uh, if you weren't here uh, that day. That's not a problem. All right, uh, Jose and Reed. All right, welcome, y'all. And then we have somebody out here in Zoom land. Who is it? Dylan. Dylan. Yeah, Dylan's here. Eleven out of thirteen. That's not bad. All right. Um, what was I doing? Oh yeah, we're doing a quiz. All right. So, uh, how did you all approach this? Anybody want to chime in? What's the first step? Set it equal to what? Well, for number one, right? We just want to add these together, right? Yeah, you do want to put equals. So by the way, I looked at y'all's last quiz. And again, we worked it in class, right? With all the details and all the steps. A lot of y'all just put the end answer and that was it, right? Again, that's not going to get you any credit in most math classes, especially when we did it in class, right? That's just lazy, right? Some people do things like this, like one half, one third, and they just plug this into a calculator. And then this one, I guess they plugged into the calculator wrong because one third is not 0.3, right? One third is 0.33333 with an infinite number of threes, right? And if you add those, you get 0.8, which is what, uh, eight out of 10 or four fifths which is not correct, right? Because they lost all of this information, right? Some people just put five, six, right? It's like, they didn't even put the equals, right? That's like if you're pointing and grunting and you just forget how to point and you're just grunting, right? You have to put all the symbols there. There's a reason why like we have the words the and of and that, right? Imagine if you're writing a sentence and all you put was the nouns and the verbs, right? You have to put all the symbols there. They belong there for a reason, right? All right, so just this all by itself. I mean, that's, what is that? All right, sure, I know what you mean, right? But come on, right? <laughs> all right. That's like, that's less than minimal effort here, okay? So, all right, we want to learn how to write mathematics, right? We want to be able to put together a sentence, complete sentence that are, you know, grammatically correct, right? Okay. Like if this was like a story, right? To just put the answer in a box, that's like, here's my story, the end. And you just put a box around the end, right? All right, we don't wanna do that. We wanna get good at this stuff because the math classes are gonna get harder, right? So we're gonna have to deal with finance and all that stuff, right? And I don't want y'all to like skate your way through here and then end up dropping out of college two years from now with debt and no degree, right? Don't, that sucks. Don't do that. All right. Student loans suck. <laughs> All right. So let's see what we could do here. This is going to be a long, difficult problem. I mean, we're just adding fractions. So let's just start a new page here and let's move number two down a little bit. All right. I mean, we're just adding some fractions here. Not a big deal, but it is a pain in the butt. One thing we're going to need is a lot of GCF, right? Or something like that. What's the smallest number that all of these numbers? we'll divide into, right? Because, I mean, we can turn, if you look at a half, a half is the same thing as two-fourths. It's the same thing as three-sixths. It's the same thing as, what, uh, four-eighths. Same thing as five-tenths. Those are all a half, right? And the same thing goes for each one of these. There's an infinite number of ways to represent those, those quantities, right? We want to pick the right one. We want to turn them all into apples or all into oranges. So we need to figure out what's the, the smallest um, common denominator. That's one we want to work with, right? Um, one way to do this, all right, I would be like the prime decomposition here. Uh, two is prime, right? Three is prime. Four is two times two, and five is prime, all right? So if I took these and I just rewrote these, in terms of their primes, it's all going to be pretty much the same except for the one fourth here. 
the four is a two times a two. So when you look at it like this, you can be like, okay, this one has two twos, but this one only has one. So I would multiply this by two over two, right? Um, let's see, this one has a three and this one has a five, but this one doesn't. So I would need a three, sorry, a three and a five down there, all right? So you gotta get the minimum combination here. All right, so there's a two, a three, this one has two twos, that one has a five. They all have to have the same things on the bottom. And if I look at the third here, it doesn't have a two under there. There's only a three, right? I need two twos and a five. So if I did this, I need another two here, hold on. Two twos and a five. So now there's two twos, a three and a five on the bottom, just like this one has. They're all gonna need two twos, a three and a five on the bottom. So like this one here, this one fourth, all right? It needs a three, a three and a five on the bottom, right? Each one of these is just the number one, all right? I'm multiplying by smart one. So this one fifth here, it needs, I'll do it again. It needs two twos and a three. So they all now have two twos, a three, and a five on the bottom. That's the common denominator. What is the common denominator? Um, it's gonna be two times two times three times five. What is that? That's 15 times two, 30 times two is 60. 60 is the smallest number that all of these divide into. Most of y'all would just be like, we'll do it a different way here in a second. Most of y'all would think, figure out this 60 and then turn all these numbers in the bottoms to 60s. And that's basically what we're doing here. So this is a 60, this is a 60, this is a 60, this is a 60. I just wrote it out in a long way in a prime decomposition style. So this one half is really 30 over 60. Five times three is 15 times two is 30. This one, this one third here, we wrote it in terms of 60, right? Five times two is 10 times two is 20, right? 20 60 is a third. And then we have our, our one fourth here, right? This is still our one fourth, right? Our one fourth and it's times one and then times one. It's still 60. We have five times three, which is 15. 15 60 is the same as one fourth. And then we have our one fifth, this dude right here, right? It's one fifth being multiplied by one three times. Uh, so the stuff on the bottom is 60. We have three times two is six times two is 12. 12 out of 60 is the same as one fifth, okay? So now since it's all 60ths, we turned all these into 60ths. So we can just add the tops across. 30 and 20 is 50 plus 15 is 65 plus 12 is 77, 77 60. So that's one way you could do it, right? Uh, let's look at it another way. Uh, do it down here. All right, I'm sure y'all probably, that would be like the last approach that y'all would take, right? How did uh, anybody do this a different way? No, y'all are shy, huh? Do we need beer or what? No. <laughs> all right. So what you need to do is find the smallest number that they all divide into. You want to find the least common denominator, the LCD. All right. How, how, have y'all been taught how to do that? I'm sure y'all have, right, for adding fractions. It's the same thing you would do if you only had these two numbers, right? If you're adding those, you find what's the smallest number that two and three both divide into. And obviously you would go six because it's obvious, right? But now we just have four numbers. What's the smallest number that those four numbers divide into? Now you can't just eyeball it, right? It's like, eh, you could start thinking, well, I don't know, maybe like 15. No, four doesn't divide into two. Uh, maybe 24, you could just sit there and guess all day, right? And that sucks, right? So this thing that I did over here is what we're looking for. LCD. All right, what is that, right? 
I'm taking all these and busting them into their prime decompositions. Two happens to be prime, three happens to be prime, four isn't, but five is. All right, so this is the prime decomposition for each one of these. So then you look at these and you see, okay, my LCD, all right, is gonna have to have at least two twos. It's gotta have a three and it's gotta have a five. And we multiply all those together and we get 60. That's how you find your least common uh, denominator. They call least common multiple. Maybe they call it an LCM. I mean, we're going to put it under a fraction, so it's a denominator, right? But I, sometimes we call it the least common multiple, right? Because you could take a multiple of this to get 20, right? A multiple of that, multiply 3 times 20, you get that. You multiply 4 times 15, you get that. You multiply 5 times 12, you get that, right? So we call it an LCM. Yes. The first one, right? Right, if I threw in another two, I would get 120, right? Right, but these all divide into 60. Yeah, we could do 120. That would work. We could turn all these into 120ths, but why do that if we could turn them into 60ths? 60ths is smaller, right? That's why. So like, whatever is over here, if, 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 uh, if three showed up like three times, you'd have to use three threes here, right? If, there's two twos, so they're all going to have to have at least two twos on the bottom, right? This one only has one two, right? So we're going to have to give it at least another two. So what you do here is, okay, how do I turn a two into 60? Uh, I'd have to multiply it by 30, right? And this is just the number one. And then this one third here, how do I turn a three into a 60? Well, I'd have to multiply it by 20. I have to put it on top. This is just the number one, right? Multiplying by the number one doesn't change the value. And then what about the one fourth? Well, I'd have to to turn a four into a 60, I'd have to multiply it by a 15, okay? And then what about the one fifth? To turn the five into a 60, I need to multiply it by a 12. So I have to do the top as well, right? This is the number one, the number one, the number one, the number one. I'm just multiplying each one of those by a smart one is all I'm doing. So this one gives us 30 sixtieths. This one gives us 20 sixtieths. This one gives us 15 sixtieths. And this one gives us 12 sixtieths. And again, now that we got a common denominator, we're adding sixtieths. We just add the tops across and you get what, 77? All right. That's how they would teach this in the book for y'all, right? I did a little different up here. Instead of writing, uh, 30 over 30, I just wrote it as a product of primes, right? This is 30, and so is this, all right? That's 30 over 30. This over here is 20 over 20. I just wrote it as a product of primes, all right? And 77, from here, we want, would want to simplify this if we could, right? Can we simplify this? At this point, we let's see, 77 is 7 times 11. That's its prime decomposition. 60 is what? 2 times 30. 30 is 2 times 15, and 15 is 3 times 5. When you do the prime decomposition, you see there's no simplification, right? There's a 7 up here, but none down there. There's 11 up here, but none down there. So we don't need to do this. This is as simple as this fraction is going to get because it won't simplify. It, you know, things are a lot about context, right? If, if I give you a bunch of decimals and ask you to add them together, I'd expect a decimal, right? If I give you a bunch of fractions and ask you to add them together, I'm expecting an answer as a fraction, right? If you did a decimal, I mean, chances are the decimal is going to be uh, some long thing and you'd end up rounding it, right? If you plugged it into your calculator all at once, your calculator is going to round it to eight decimal points. If you write that down, equality simply isn't true. That's not equal anymore. It would be approximately equal. So if you see fractions, you want to give your answer in a fraction. Just like if you're doing finance, if you're working in uh, you know, American dollars, you don't want to give the client their answer in pesos. Right? Now, what you could do is at this point, 
once you've done the math, you could say, okay, fine. Just in case, I'm going to do 77 divided by 60. And say this is approximately 1.283. So you give both answers. This is what I'm looking for. This, you know, this process tells me that you understand the math and the ability to add fractions, right? Without a calculator. This just tells me that you know how to plug it into a calculator and approximate. Notice I used approximately because I rounded to three decimal places here. It's actually this. If I put that, I could put it equals because this three repeated forever and ever and ever is clear from the calculator, right? Then that's an exact answer, right? But if you're just gonna round, if you leave that off, you have to say approximately, okay? Does that make sense? So a lot of stuff is context as to what people are expecting, right? All right, let's look at uh, any questions. I know we just spent 20 minutes on adding fractions, but fractions are hard, right? They are hard. All right, let's see here. Uh, let me get rid of this. Let's All right, so in the review, I think they did some like, they did some real simple, like one simple example of this stuff, right? All right, so we're kind of jumping the gun here. This is what we're gonna cover in this section today. But I'm assuming y'all seen this before, like how to solve for X past classes, right? So it's not your first time to see this, right? Now this is hard too, right? Unless you've done it like a lot, like years every day and it becomes simple, right? But there's stuff, it's a lot of uh, reflex, like pattern recognition. You do it a little bit every day, then it becomes easy and you can do it without thought, right? But when you're first looking at it, even if you get the rules down, you've memorized the rules, it's still real easy to make simple mistakes, right? So first thing we want to do, we have to get, we have to rearrange this equation to get a new equation that looks like this, x equals some number, right? So that's what we're going to do. This is a mathematical expression. There's X's in it. We just want to rearrange it to get the X by itself. So we'll do this in a couple of different ways here. So this equation is logically equivalent to, let's see, I hate these parentheses. Parentheses suck. So I'm going to just distribute the two. Two times X is two X. Two times one is two. And then I still have this three X plus two. So all I did was distribute the two across. So this equation is the same as this one. They are logically equivalent. They contain the same information, no more, no less, right? I just rearranged it a little bit to get rid of the parentheses. Now I have all these uh, X's. I have X's here and I have X's here. I want to get all the X's together, right? So what I'll do is I will, let's say, I want, let's, if I want to get the X's on the left side, I want to get rid of that and I want to move it over here. What I'll do is I'll subtract three halves X from both sides. All right, so this is a new equation, but it's logically equivalent to the one we started off with. So this three halves X minus three halves X, those go away, right? So now I have X's here and X's there. Um, I can combine these, right? They're like terms. Um, this 2x is really 4x over 2, right? Why am I doing that? Because this is halves and this is half. I want a common denominator so that I can combine those, right? So from here to here, I'm just rewriting 2x as 4x over 2. Make sense? Why? Because I want to put these x's together. So in the next step, I'm going to be like, well, four minus three leaves me one X over two, all right? Four X minus three X is X, but they're halves. And then I still got this plus two hanging around. And over here, I still got a two, okay? Make this work with this one painful step at a time. So I got all the X's consolidated here. Um, I don't want this hanging around, right? I want X equals a number. So I don't want this, I need to get rid of it. So I'm going to subtract two from both sides. Those go away, I have X over two equals two minus two is zero. 
all right? But I don't want to know what x over 2 is. I want to know what x is. So I'm going to multiply both sides by the number 2. And then 2 over 2 goes away, and I'm left with x equals, and 2 times 0 is 0. So this is just a long-winded way of saying x equals 0. Saying x equals 0 says the exact same thing this says, just a much shorter abbreviated way. Okay. So that's one approach you could do. I mean, by the end of this class, you should be able to look at this and almost do it in your head. Okay. Let's look at it another way here. Um, I might look at this and go like, man, fractions suck, right? So I'm just going to multiply both sides by the number two, right? Because I don't like half. If I do that, I end up with two times two is four. And over here, I have two times three halves is just three. And then two times two is four. So I might do that first just to get rid of the fractions, multiply both sides by the number two, right? Subtlety here, right? You don't want to multiply the two times both of those, right? If you have um, three times four, right? And you multiply that by two, this is just two times three times four, right? You wouldn't say this is two times three times two times four. You have two twos in there, right? So you only have to multiply the two times the four, that's it, right? This is just a number, the three numbers multiplied together. So if you're wondering, do I multiply the two times the two and the two times that? No, that would be an extra two in there, right? This is just three numbers multiplied together. So you might wanna do that first, you know, if you don't like fractions. And then we could, Distribute the four, we have a four X, four times one is four, and then we have three X plus four. So we got rid of the fractions and then we got rid of the parentheses. Now we might say, well, let's get all the X's over here. So we'll subtract three X from both sides. Four X minus three X is X. Three X minus three X is zero. So from here, we could say, well, let's get rid of these four, subtract four from both sides, and we got x equals zero. So that's a different approach, same answer, right? When you're checking your work, it's a good idea to try a different approach, see if you get the same answer, right? And you could always type this into Google, solve for x, and type that in. Or that Wolf, Wolfram Alpha app, you could type it in, solve for x, just type that in, and it'll tell you the answer. If you pay the monthly subscription, you could say, what's the step-by-step? -step? And then it would show you. I'm sure there's other apps. There's what, photo math or math topper or something. There's lots of different ones. So, you know, use your technology, not just to get the answer, right? But use it to be able to comprehend the math, right? Okay, questions? All right, so let's move on to the book. Uh, if I can find it. So we are in 1.1 here. Let me see if I can shrink this. All right, so here's an equation. It looks a lot like the one we just had, right? Here's an inequality. All right, inequality suck. Usually we just treat it as an equals, and then once we've solved, then we change it back to an inequality. All right, but we want to be able to deal with both of these things. So both of these are called first degree. It's because you only see an x, and there's no x squareds or x cubes or x to the fourth, right? X is the same thing as x to the first power, right? We don't write the to the first power, but that's why it's called a first degree, which makes it linear. Okay, and we'll see later when we graph this stuff why this would be linear, okay? So this can always be rewritten into something that looks like this, ax plus b equals zero. You can always rearrange it to make it look like that. Really, we wanna make it look like x equals a number if we're solving for it, right? But we can do this, right? You just subtract b from both sides and then divide by a. 
all right? Uh, but they like to put it like this form because this is what we would call a first degree polynomial, okay? So a solution of an equation involving a single variable is a number that when substituted for the variable makes the equation or inequality true. So up here on this quiz, we should have done a check, right? Check our work, plug zero in for the X and make sure that both, hand, both sides are equal, right? So let's do our check here real quick. If I replace this with a zero, I replace this, with a zero, this is the same thing as saying, well, this is zero plus one is just one. And then three halves times zero, that's just zero. And yeah, two is equal to two, All right? That's how you check your work. You always wanna check your work, right? If you're trying to get full credit, all right? Uh, there's a whole bunch of paragraphs, which is boring. So let's move on. Like we really learn by working the examples, right? All right, equality properties. So here we have theorems. An equivalent expression will result if the same quantity is added or subtracted from each side of a given equation, or each side of a given equation is multiplied or divided by the same non-zero quantity. So that's what this thing is right here, this symbol, right? I can create a equivalent expression, as long as I'm only multiplying or dividing both sides by something or adding or subtracting both sides. Whatever I do to one side, I have to do the other. Now there's lots of things we could do. We could like square both sides or take the square root of both sides, right? But that doesn't always necessarily make an equivalent expression. When you do that, you might be adding extra solutions or losing solutions, okay? So you have to be careful with stuff like that. Like if you divide both sides by X, well, that's fine, except for if x is zero, because you can't divide by zero. Okay, so when you start doing weird stuff, you have to be careful. This thing might break down and it might become this or this, right? That's what this is. It's a combination of those two, right? And that's just implications. This implies this. If A, then B, right? This is what we need. That's if and only if or a one-to-one -one relationship. I don't know if we'll end up, if these will break, but if they do, I'll show you. All right, it's a subtlety, but hopefully I think it shows up in the end of math in here, unless we do log, logarithms. All right, so how many of y'all have issues with stuff like this still? All right, I don't know how much y'all covered this in the past classes. It's all right, like mediocre difficulty. So you can do some of them, but you might mess up the long ones. All right, all right so basically you just need a lot of practice, all right? All right. Every day, got to do it every day, right? Remember, we can't go to the gym for 24 hours and come out buff, right? So if we go for an hour a day for 24 days every other day, we can actually see some progress, right? All right, so we have this huge mess. What do we want to do? We want to simplify it. Let's get rid of parentheses and all that stuff. So uh, here they're going to just to get rid of these parentheses. Let me, I mean, I don't want to just read the solution to you. That would be boring. So let's uh, work this separately. All right, so if I look at this, I'm like, eh, parentheses suck, right? Let's get rid of the parentheses. So this is equivalent to, if I multiply everything here by a minus three. So minus three times X is a minus three X. A minus three times a minus four is a positive 12. We had a three times an X a three times a minus four. And then we still have this plus six hanging around. So I got rid of the parentheses, right? Uh, now we can collect like terms. That's one thing we could do, right? This eight X minus three X is really five X. And over here I can collect those. So minus 12 plus six is a minus six. So I got rid of parentheses, collected like terms. Uh, now, we could do two steps at once here, all right? I want to get all the x's over here. So how do I get rid of those? Well, I'm going to subtract 3x from both sides, okay? So that'll go away. So I have a 5x minus 3x, that becomes 2x. Over here, we got a minus 6, all right? 
but now you might be confused like uh, I just want x by itself do I get rid of the 12 or the 2 first you can do it either way but it's easier if you get rid of this 12 first if I subtract both sides by 12 I'm going to get a 2x equals negative 18 All right now we can get rid of this 2 right the opposite of multiplying is dividing we'll divide both sides by 2 because 2 over 2 is just the number 1 and then we can simplify this we have a minus 18 divided by 2 is just 9 right now what if i'm here let's look at this we have a 2x plus 12 equals negative 6 you know we got rid of the 12 first right it's like, what if you try to get rid of this two first? What if you do it out of order? You can do it. It's just more complicated and it's easier to make a mistake, right? What if you do to one side, you have to do the other. And that means the whole side. You can't just divide this by two. You have to divide the whole thing by two. All right? So if you did it that way, you would have 2x over 2 is x. 12 over 2 is 6. And then minus three over two is a minus three, All right? And then you could subtract six from both sides and we get X equals minus nine. So you could do it that way, but typically to avoid taking a fraction like over a whole big expression, right? You wanna get rid of this dude first and then divide by the two, right? I mean, you can do it the other way around, but typically you don't. Questions about that? All right. Let's look at. And again, you want to check your work, right? Take this number and plug it into the X's and make sure that both sides are equal. How was traffic last time? Getting out early, did it help at all, you think? By the time I got out of here, it was just all traffic like five minutes behind you, you know? Now here's a match problem. Check it out. All right, so we got a bunch of parentheses and stuff again, no problem. Let's get rid of the parentheses because they're just in the way. We have a three X here. We need to distribute this dude across. So a minus two times two X is a minus four X. And the minus two times the minus five gives us a positive 10. This guy we need to distribute. Two times X is two X. And then two times three is six. And then we have a minus eight hanging out. Okay. So now let's... Uh, Let's collect like terms. We could put these together. 3x minus 4x is a negative x. And over here, we, we still have our 2x, but we can combine these. 6 minus 8 is a minus 2. Right? You don't have to write all this stuff down. Again, I'll post the notes right after class. For me, when I was in class, I found that trying to take notes just meant I ended up with a whole bunch of scribbles I didn't understand. I couldn't follow anything the teacher was saying, right? So it's usually better in like a class like this, probably just to follow, right? Try to follow each step because every time you look up and then you look away, I'm still going, right? And at that rate, we'll never get through this material. And again, I'll post the notes right after class, right? I mean, you, if there's something that comes to your mind you want to write down or whatever, I would only write down stuff that supplements this, right? So stuff that whenever you look at these notes later, your notes help you understand them, right? If you write anything down, right? Unless, of course, you need to write the notes to keep from falling asleep. I, I fell asleep in at least four out of five classes I ever sat through. I just couldn't stay awake. Caffeine, Adderall, waiting so I had to pee real bad. You know, none of it worked. I like just fall out 15 minutes in. Uh, so we'll try to keep this uh, going. Hopefully I won't fall asleep. All right, so we got we collected the like terms. We want to get all the x's to one side or the other, right? We got some x's here. We got some x's here. Let's get rid of these x's. So we will subtract two x from both sides, all right? 
So minus x minus 2x is a minus 3x. Okay, so again, we're at the point here. Do I deal with the minus 3 first or the 10? You can do it either way. It's easier to get rid of this 10 first. All right, so we have this minus 3x and minus 2 minus 10 is a minus 12, right? Now it's easy to get rid of this minus 3. Minus 3 over minus 3 is just 1. So we're left with x. And over here, these minuses cancel. 12 over 3 is just 4, right? Once you're done, check your work. Plug it in everywhere. We could say, uh, here's one approach. We could say, check. Left-hand side, so we have a 3, 3x. Three so we need a 3 times a 4. And then we have this 2. It's a 2 times a 4. So I'm just replacing the x. So that's left-hand side. Let's simplify it. 3 times 4 is 12. The stuff in the parentheses, 2 times 4 is 8, minus 5 is 3. So I have a 12, 2, and 3 gets us 6. 12 minus 6 is 6. So that's the left hand side. Let's look at the right hand side. And again, we're replacing the x's with uh, 4. So we have 2, 4 plus 3 minus 8. So 4 plus 3 is 7. 2 times 7 is 14. 14 minus 8 is 6. So the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Okay. All right. That's a little different than how I did it last time, right? There's the check here. Check. I said left-hand side equals the right-hand side if and only if left-hand side equals right-hand side if and only if left-hand side equals right-hand side. It's a different way of writing stuff, right? I worked with the whole equation, both sides at the same time. Whereas here, I just picked one side, simplified it, picked the other side, simplified it, and showed that they're equal. So you could do that either way. Okay. All right, let's look at example two here. Is this x plus 2 minus x over 3? x plus 2 over 2 minus x over 3 equals 5. Oh, this is a good one because it has fractions and fractions suck. So, first thing I would do is go, I hate fractions. How do I get rid of these fractions? Is there something I can multiply both sides by to get rid of the fractions? All right. If I multiply both sides by six, the fractions all go away. So I'm going to do shortcut notation here. Right. Typically, I would want to do this like that. Right. That's correct mathematical notation. But I'm going to abuse. I'm going to say to multiply everything by six and assume that you know what I mean. So that's informal notation, right? Technically, it's not correct, but there's no other way to interpret that. I'm multiplying everything by 6, right? I mean multiply both sides by 6. So if I multiply this by 6, okay, this guy, if I multiply it by 6, 6 over 2 is 3, right? Well, I could read that. Right? I'll leave it there. Let's do 6. If I multiply that by 6, I have minus a third times 6, and then I have this 5 times 6. So if we're going to do it step by step, I'm just multiplying every single term or thing by 6, right? And why did I pick 6? Because 2 divides into 6. 6 over 2 is 3. 6 over 3 is 2. 5 times 6 is 30. So I just took this guy and I turned it into this. I just got rid of the fractions by multiplying by 6. So fractions aren't that bad. You can always just get rid of them, right? When you're dealing with equations, right? Like when you have like a bunch of fractions, you can always like zoom in. You get closer to something that looks bigger, right? That's all we're doing. We're just taking six steps towards the equation. So now it looks our size instead of all 
halves and thirds, right? So I multiplied everything by six, I get this. Now let's get rid of the parentheses. So we need to distribute the three. Three times X is three X. Three times two is six. All right, now we can collect like terms. We got X's, three X minus two X is just X. And now we want the X by itself. So let's get rid of that six there. And we are left with X by itself, 30 minus six is 24. All right, then you check your work, plug it in. All right, so you don't, we, we could have done this with, all right, if we didn't do this trick first, we could do it that way, it just sucks, right? Um, this guy is the same thing as X over two plus two over two. And we have X over three equals five, right? So then we buy like, okay, I need to combine my X's, all right? So from that very first uh, example quiz that we did, right? We had a half plus a third, we turned it into six, right? X over two is the same thing as three X over six, right? One half is the same as three six. Then this guy is the same thing as two six. Two over two is just one. Now we can add these fractions. Three minus two is one. And now we can subtract one from both sides. Five minus one is four. Now we can multiply both sides by six. We have x equals 24. It should be the same thing we got up here, yeah, all right? So that sucked, right? We're having to find common denominators and all that crap, right? We don't wanna do that. Just get rid of the fractions from the start, boom. It's way easier. All right, all right, here we go. We got a whole bunch of fractions again. I don't want any fractions. What can I multiply this thing by to get rid of the fractions? What's the smallest number that two, three, and four will all divide into? 12, right? You can look at it in this obvious, right? Let's assume there is a bunch of fractions, right? And we have to do the other way. Like when I had the half and a third and the fourth and the fifth, right? We couldn't just guess it, right? Let's look at these. We have a a two, that's prime. We have a three, that's prime, but the four is two times two. So our LCM, we need at least two twos and we need a three. Because there's two twos and a three here, which is two times two is four times three is 12. That's what you're doing in your head. You just don't realize it, all right? So 12, I'm gonna be, I'm going to abuse my notation and be like, let's multiply this thing by 12. So 12 over 3, 12 divided by 3 is 4. 12 over 4 is 3. 12 over 2 is 6. So I'll follow that step. I just didn't write it all out. All right. Okay, so now let's get rid of parentheses. Distribute four times X is four X, four times one is four. Now let's combine these like terms. Four X minus three X is X. Now let's get rid of this four here. We have X equals six minus four is two. Not too bad, right? Just a couple of steps, right? And you need to show all your steps when you were doing this. Later on in the, the, the class, where I assume that you can do this stuff without effort, right? Because we're focused on trying to apply financial formulas and stuff like that, right? Then you can, any of these steps that you can skip in your head, you can skip those steps. But right now we're focused on learning this. So you need to show all your steps for this stuff, right? Later on, when we're doing complicated stuff, you'll want to be able to right, do some of this in your head. Okay? So practice, let's practice. All right, it's, let's see, it's four o'clock. Uh, we've made it through two problems. In this class, let's take a, a, a five minute bathroom break. That's cool with y'all. And then we'll come back and see how far we can make it.
So, where were we? Uh, we just did the max problem. Everything we're doing is in the book, right? I mean, writing down, right? If you write down all your notes, one, you have the notes I wrote already online, and the book has everything step by step here. So, all right, so here, here's an equation. There's not even any numbers, right? We don't need numbers, right? You can just use a letter and be like, well, it's whatever number you want, right? So solving a formula for a particular variable. So they give us this A equals P plus RT. Really, this what this is coming from is interest. Uh, simple interest. All right, this is the best of formula in college. I par T. Right, you can all remember I party, right? I is the interest, P is the principal, R is the annual interest rate, and T is the time in years. All right, so principal is the amount of money that you put in the bank or whatever that you're investing, right? So, um, R specifically is an annual interest rate. Word annual is important, I think I should. And no, I misspelled it. Annual. Easy to turn that into a bad joke. Okay. T is the time specifically in years. All right. Let's do some dimensional analysis here. The interest should be money, right? The principal is money. The interest rate is per year. And the time is in years, right? So if we just look at the units, right? The years cancel out and you have money equals money. That's important. So if you're trying to remember a formula and you can't quite remember, look at the units. The units have to match up, right? You don't wanna have money equals pizza, right? You don't wanna have like dollars equals feet, inches, pounds, right? So if you're trying to remember formulas, just think about the units. The units have to match up here, okay? So later on, we'll have different formulas. Like we, we use the same formulas in like biology and all that, but it might not be uh, annual interest rate. It might be like minutes instead of years, okay? So they might use the letter K instead of the letter R for the same thing, right? If they're talking about like bacteria growing, right? It doubles every, you know, three minutes, something like that, right? So you're gonna see different letters representing the same mathematical thing because it's a different context. So this is just the interest. So the amount of money that you're going to have is going to, at the, at the end of a given time, right? So this depends on the time. It also depends on the interest rate, right? So we'll just put amount. The amount is gonna be the interest plus the principal. But the, in, the interest is the principal times the rate times the time. Okay, I should have wrote this another way, but notice they both have principal in it. So if you factor out the principal, you have RT plus one, or uh, they usually like to write it one plus RT. So that's your amount here. I think they are using this version of it. Yeah, they're using this version. So you notice the P shows up twice. You could factor it out. But uh, for our, our sakes here, what we want to do for part A is they're asking you to solve for R, all right? So if we have amount equals uh, P plus PRT, all right? If we want to rearrange this just to get the rate by itself, we can do that. Here's R. How can we get it by itself? Let's try to get everything else moved over here. So what we could do is subtract P from both sides. So we have A minus P equals P R T, right? We want the R by itself. So let's get rid of the P and the T. We have to do it to both sides. So P over P is one, T over T is one. So now we have A minus P over PT is equal to R, 
That's what they said. Find R in terms of A, P, and T. Right? We could do that. What if we wanted to get uh, T by itself? If we want to get T by itself, we could do the same thing. We could uh, subtract P from both sides. We got an A minus P equals P R T. If I want T by itself, I've got to get rid of the P and the R. I have to do it to both sides. That's one and that's one. We have A minus P over P R equals T by itself. Or what if we want to get P by itself, right? We want to get P by itself. Well, there's two P's here. First thing I would do is factor that P out, right? Bring those out, boom. Now P is by itself, well, except for this. So how do I get rid of this? Well, I need to divide both sides by one plus RT. Because this over this is just one. Put my little symbol here. So now I have A over one plus RT is equal to P. So this is useful, this is useful, this is useful. Usually we just use this, right? Because usually you want to know the amount given the principle and the rate and the time, right? But sometimes you know the amount and you know the time and you're like, well, how much do I need to invest today if I want to end up with this amount in this many years at this rate, right? So you want to be able to rearrange these uh, formulas, right? You want, you want to be able to isolate any variable. All right, it's not hard, right? Just basic, basic algebra. Whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. And that's all of algebra, right? All right, so let's look at a match problem here. All right, a cardboard box has length L, width W, and height H. Then its surface area is given by this formula, S for surface area, twice length times width, twice length times height, and twice width times height, right? And that, if you got a box, let's draw a box here. Do, 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 do. So uh, here's our width, here's our height, and here's our length, right? And then we, Um, where are all these twos coming from? Well, this is the same as that, right? So the area of this would be, this is our height, right? This is length times height, length times height. That's why it shows up twice. Then we got this side and this side. Well, that's width times height, and you have to do it for each side of the box. So you have two width times heights. Then you have Oh, I just did that one. So we have the bottom and the top down there, the bottom and the top, right? So the top, let's see, here's the length and here's the width. We have the length times the width that covers the top, and then you have to do it twice for the bottom. So that's why that's the surface area. Does that make sense? All right. Solve the formula. Solve for L in terms of the other. So, right, um, L is showing up at two different places here. So let's start off with surface. Let me see what it is. Surface equals two L that double equal here. Two L W, two L H, two W H. All right. Um, so we have to get our L's together. All right. So what I would do here is I would factor the L out. So you have L and two W plus two H. And then we still have a 2WH. Okay, so we got those L's combined by factoring, right? This turned into that. Does that make sense, right? 2LW and then 2HL or 2LH. So now we want this by itself. So this is just a number, right? Let's get this out of the way. Let's subtract 2WH from both sides. So we end up with S minus 2WH is equal to this. But we want the L by itself, so let's get rid of this thing. 2W, 2H. 2W, 
2H. So that goes away. And now I have L is equal to that pile of stuff. Make sense? That ain't pretty, but it's what they asked us to do. Uh, over here, they want us to start with this. All right, I didn't write all my greater than my equivalents here, but you know it's there, right? If I was writing something I was going to turn in, I'd make sure I put that there. For the brevity of doing this quickly, right, as scratch work, I'm going to leave those out sometimes, but realize that they are there, it's implied. So here they want H in terms of all this stuff. What they're saying here is H. H is a function of surface area, length, and width, right? H depends on those, if you want to rewrite it that way. So H here is showing up uh, twice. So let's factor the H out. So H, 2L plus 2W, right? There's the 2LH, and here's the 2WH. So now that we have the H consolidated, right? Let's get rid of that. Let's get that off its back. So let's get rid of the 2LW. Subtracting that from both sides. That gives us S minus 2LW equals H. It's 2L plus 2W. So here's our H by itself. This is in the way. Let's get rid of it. Whatever we do to one side, we have to do to the other. That over that's just the number one. Now we have H equals that pile of stuff that we've got. Is that, are you okay with that? Okay. So simple steps, simple concepts, we can apply them to big, ugly, complicated things and it makes it look like we're doing really sophisticated, complicated math. All we're doing is subtracting the same thing from both sides and then dividing both sides by the same thing, All right? Inequalities. All right, inequality sucks, but we can do it. Uh, replace each question mark with either less than or greater than. Okay, well, this isn't hard, right? So A here, three is less than five. Remember your symbols, think of the number line, right? This is greater than, this is less than, right? This points to the small stuff. This points to the big stuff, right? So three is less than five. Uh, B here, negative six. Well, here's negative six and here's negative two, right? Negative six is to the left of negative two. Negative six is less than negative two. And then C, we have zero and minus 10. Here's zero and over here is minus 10, right? Zero is bigger than minus 10. Y'all okay with that? It's easy to slip up and make a mistake there, right? A simple concept, but all right, dyslexia is a real thing. All right, we all make mistakes. So if you screw it up, don't worry, right? Try to, try to program the brain to where you can do it reflexively. Um, We don't need to explore and discuss. I think it's pretty easy. Let's look at our theorem here. Let's see. Inequality properties. An equivalent inequality will result, and the sense or direction will remain the same if each side of the original inequality has the same real number added or subtracted from it. So you can add or subtract from both sides of an inequality and you get an equivalent inequality, all right? And the, the critical thing here is if you multiply both sides by a negative number, you have to flip the inequality, okay? That's what this whole paragraph is about. Because think about it, one is less than two, isn't it? But if I multiply both sides by a minus, well, I have to switch this because minus one is bigger than a minus two, right? Where are they? Here's minus one, here's minus two. Minus one is to the right of minus two. So 
that's all you really have to remember. If you're multiplying or dividing by a minus, you have to flip the inequality, right? Because that's what you're basically doing is you're taking your number line, flipping it around. Um, all right, interval notation. Uh, so this is gonna be a whole bunch of notation. It's not complicated, but. All right, so here's an interval from A to B, all right? So let's say here is uh, A and here is B, all right? Oh, I guess they already drew it right here. So here's our number line. They're saying all the numbers in between A and B, including A and B. So a square bracket means include the endpoints, all right? A round bracket means don't include the endpoints, all right? So this one is, everything between A and B, including A and B. You could draw it like that. This one is everything in between A and B, but don't include A and B. So you use round brackets, right? So that's the difference between round and square brackets. Does that make sense? Another way they might draw this is sometimes they might have a open circle versus a closed circle closed circle, like on graphs and things like that. If you're looking at a graph, they might use open circles and solid circles for the endpoints to represent the same thing. All right, so here we're including A, but not B, right? We're including A, but not B. You'd want to square on A and around on B, okay? When it comes to infinity or negative infinity, that's always a round bracket. You never put a square bracket with infinity because infinity is not a number, it's a direction. Right, so you never actually get there. That makes sense. So I think y'all could figure this stuff out. That's not too complicated. Um, there are some more symbols that we want to deal with, which I guess we'll get to here soon. Um, all right, write this as a double inequality and graph a double inequality. Oh, I guess what they mean is um, negative two is less than or equal to X is less than three. So this is a square bracket. So you have to have the equal to. This one's a round bracket. So you don't have the equal to there. So this is what they would call a double inequality. So it's two things at once. You're saying this and you're saying this. And you can put those together nicely. All right, and then they want us to draw the picture. Uh, there's the picture. All right, we're including the minus two, but not the three. Um, X greater than or equal to minus five is the same as this interval. We're saying X can be between uh, minus five and infinity. Sometimes you might see me write like X is an element of that interval. If you see this symbol, that means element of. It just means x is an element of this interval. They just write the interval, right? And it's just implied from this that that's what they mean. But in other higher level math classes, you might see symbols like this, right? Um, we also want to have a way of like having two or three separate intervals, combining them, in which case we'll use a union. Show that one with this. So let's look at this guy. So when we're dealing with an inequality, it's pretty much just like dealing with the regular equality, right? Except if you multiply or divide by a minus, you have to flip it. So if we start off with this guy, right? We got what? Two times two x plus three less than six times x minus two plus ten. All right. So you approach it the same way. Let's get rid of the parentheses. So we're gonna have a four x plus six less than six X minus 12, all right? Let's combine like terms. Um, we can do two steps at once, right? I want all the X's over here. So let's get rid of the six X from both sides, okay? And since all my, this is gonna go away, all my X's are gonna be over here. Let's get rid of this six. I'm gonna wanna subtract six from both sides. So 4x minus 6x is negative 2x. I have a less than. 
negative 12 plus 10 is negative 2, minus 6 is negative 8. And now I'll divide both sides by a minus 2, which will cause this to flip. So that's gone. The minus is canceled. So I am left with x is greater than 8 divided by 2, which is 4. All right, so we started off with it pointing one way. We had to flip it because we divided by a minus 2. Okay. So x greater than 4 is the same thing as saying 4 to infinity. Or you can draw that picture. Solving a double equality. Some of this stuff I haven't done in a long, long time. So, uh, might be kind of slow, like a double equality. Remember solving these. Um, let's write this down. Minus three less than two x plus three less than or equal to nine. Something like this. If I was looking at this, I might solve them separately. I might do this separate from this because that's what they're really saying, right? Um, but I guess we could do just like we would work with this. Whatever we do to one side, we have to do the other. As long as we do it to all three sides here, we can do that, right? So if we want to get the x by itself, let's get rid of that. So if we subtract three from everything, right, this gives us a negative six, two x, nine minus three is six, okay? Now we would just want the x by itself, so let's get rid of these two, this two here. So I'm left with negative six divided by two is a negative three, and six divided by two is three. So x has to be between minus three and three. Okay. Uh, and we want a square bracket for the three and a round bracket for the minus three because of those symbols. Okay. All right, applications, real world problems. Oh, not take that. Uh, next question, next question. Purchase price. Alex purchases a big screen TV. He pays 7% sales tax and is charged $65 for delivery. Alex's total cost is $1,668.93. What was the purchase price of the TV? So first off, we want to start throwing down some letters that represent numbers in the problem, right? Um, first thing he says, he pays 7% sales tax. So uh, we could use T for tax, right? But that looks like a plus sign. So I would use a T that looks like that. And they say 7%. Well, remember 7% means, percent symbol means per 100. And that's the same thing as 0.07, right? You don't want to have percent symbols floating around in your equation. Again, this symbol was invented simply to make it faster to write that, okay? So that's what it means. And you divide by 100, you're simply moving your uh, decimal. All right. He's charged $65 for delivery. Okay. So it's, I don't know, I'll use D for delivery. Okay. And if Alex's total cost is this amount, uh, I don't know, I'll use A for amount. 1668.93. What was the purchase price of the TV? So I'll use P for price. Okay. So if we set this up uh, with just the letters, right? Um, the amount is going to be the purchase price, all right, plus the tax, plus the delivery fee. That makes sense. And what do we want to solve for? We want to find T, right? 
some of y'all would just plug the numbers in first, right? You wouldn't even use the letter A. You'd just be plugging numbers in. That's how y'all would probably do it, right? The way I do things is I just use letters for everything. Then I'll solve for P here. If I want P by itself, I need to subtract the taxes from both sides and subtract delivery fee from both sides. So P here is A minus T minus D. And then I plug the numbers in on the last step, right? Um, but what is T here? It's, uh, I shouldn't have used T. This should have been R. This is our rate, our tax rate, right? We don't know what T is yet. Right, let's, let's scoot back. All right, this is our rate. So we have to use, how do we find out what, uh, what the taxes are? All right, our tax is going to be, well, we don't know, do we? We don't know the price, right? It would be the price times the rate. <laughs> All right, so I made a simple problem really complicated, hold on. <laughs> Uh, let's see, we have, if we just do the numbers, let's do the number approach, see if that helps. This is the amount, right? And that should equal the $65 plus, plus whatever the price of the TV is, plus the taxes. But the taxes, is the price times the interest rate, right? Does that make sense so far? So we need to solve for P. So uh, we could subtract 65 from both sides. And this we can factor out the P. So if we Subtract this, this would be what, 1603.93? Over here, if we factor the P out, we have P times one plus 0.07, right? Because this is really P times one, isn't it? We just don't write the one there. Does that make sense? P is P times one. So if we factor the P out, we have a one and a 1.07. Well, one plus 1.07 0 0.07 is just 1.07. And usually we don't put P times 1.07. We would like to write 1.07 times P because it looks prettier, right? We don't write X times two because two times X looks better. So now we need to divide both sides by 1.07. And we can plug that into a calculator and we have what P is, okay? Make sense? All right, let's see. Let's take a look and see how they approach it here. So they have the delivery charge, the sales tax. So they use X instead of P for the price. The sales tax is 0.07 times X being the price of the TV. And then they got the total cost. So the total cost is price, delivery charge, sales tax. You can see you have X showing up twice here. So they just combine these X and 0.07X is 1.07X, right? I factored the X out. It's the same thing as just adding one plus 0.07 and keeping your X, okay? So you end up with this guy here. I combine the X's, subtracted the 65 and divide by the 1.07, okay? And if you plug that in your calculator, you get 14.99. So this is 14.99. All right, so even simple problems, like when you're trying to start them off, it can be complicated. Sometimes, like I did, I just started over. It's like, nah, this is just way, what I'm doing is more complicated than the problem, right? Try a different approach, okay? And when you do that, when you're trying to solve a problem, don't erase what you did or throw your paper away, right? Keep that work and get a new page and write second attempt. Because some problems you might have five or six or seven attempts and you will forget what you tried and what you didn't try, right? So 
So keep your password, don't throw it away or delete it, okay? We use it for reference. All right, and then you can check your answer, right? Let's look at a match column number eight here. Let's see if we figure it out. All right, Mary paid 8.5% sales tax. So first off, we know our rate is 0.085, right? We move the decimal twice to get rid of that cursor symbol. And $190 title and license fee, all right? So we have, I'll use F for fee is $190. When she bought a new car for a total of 28,000, so the total amount, or we could use C for total cost is 28,400. Uh, what is the purchase price of the car? I'll call that P. Okay, so we could set this up. The total cost is the fees plus the price plus the, what was it? the tax. And the tax is the price times the rate, okay? So uh, what we want here is to find out what P is, right? We could simplify this right here. We could have the cost is the fees. One plus 0.085 is 1.085 P. I guess I have to put it back on, right? This is one P plus 0.085 P is 1.085 P. So what we want is P by itself. So if we subtract the F from both sides, we have C minus F equals 1.085 P. We still want the P by itself, so let's get rid of this 1.085. Uh, so P is C minus F over 1.85. The way I was trying to do this, instead of that 0.85, I would just had R there, but we'll leave it like this. So the last step is you plug in the numbers, right? The C is 28,400. The F is 190. And we have 1.085. So I was trying to show you when I first did this was instead of putting the 0 0.085 there, just write the letter as R, right? This is R. So all of this is just, uh, hold on. If we do it this way, uh, I lost my P. Here it is P. All right, let's hold on. do it this way, where you just have the letters. Because writing that 1.085 over and over again sucks, right? If you can just write the letter R and then at the very end, plug the numbers in. That's what we want to do. So the cost is the fees plus the price times the interest plus the interest, right? So we would say this is P times one plus R, okay? Plus, plus, I just factored out the P. So I want the P by itself. Let's get rid of the F. So I have C minus F equals P times one plus R, all right? I want P by itself. So let's divide both sides by one plus R. So P here is C minus F over one plus R. Then you plug in your numbers. The cost was 28,400. The fee was what, 110, 190. And then R was point something, point oh eight five. See, so this right here up to this point, this is exactly the same as the first example. This example here, if I use those letters, this is the solution to both problems, right? The only difference in both examples is the numbers you're plugging in, right? That's why you wanna be able to work with the letters first because like let's say you have 
a section where there's like 10 different problems. They're really all the same problem. They're just with different numbers, right? So if you just solve it once with the letters, you solved all the problems in one, in one problem, basically, realizing that they're all the same, right? That's what the quadratic formula does. Y'all remember that, right? Negative B plus or minus square root of B squared minus four AC all over two A, right? They give you that after you've spent three weeks solving for X with all these different quadratics, right? They teach you, you know, like differences squares and all these tricks, factoring and all that. And then they show you the quadratic formula. And it's like, why didn't you give that to me in the first place? You just plug the numbers in and you get the answer every time, right? Okay, so, I mean, you wanna do it with the numbers first, like we did here, just plug the numbers in. Right, so the only thing that's there is the p. That's what you're looking for. Then you can simplify the numbers, get the p by itself. Right, but if you do that, then every single one of these problems is a brand new problem. Right, but if you work with the letters, right, it's like I have a rate, I have a fee, and I have a cost, and I need to find out the price. Right, so you start off with that. What do you want to know? You want to know what p is. So you can solve for P, right? All right, cost, B, price, and PR is a, the, not the interest, the tax, all right? And then you can get the P by itself. You end up with this expression. You know the answer every time. You can plug that in your calculator. I'm not even gonna plug it in the calculator because I don't care, right? Typically, y'all would wanna just Whatever this is, that's what you would put an answer and put a box around it and not show me anything else, right? That's how math students like to do it, but they're missing out on all the math, right? Realizing that all these problems are the same problem. Okay. All right, so let's move on to break even analysis. Oops. Usually teachers will teach like the same class, like seven times in a day, right? So by the time you're like on your third or fourth repetition, you know all the details and it comes out way smooth, right? Or they've taught it for three or four years at least. They've been through it like 400 times. And this is the first time I'm teaching this class, so it's gonna be a little rough, yeah. Yeah, yeah you gotta go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we gotta make money, right? Work. <clears throat> All right, so let's see, break even analysis. And part of this rough approach is problem solving. What you wanna learn in here is problem solving, not problem knowing, right? If I already knew all these examples and I could just write them down by heart with the solution, you're not getting like, what do you do when you don't know what to do? How do you figure stuff out, right? You don't wanna have to memorize the solution to every financial problem, right? You just wanna be able to figure it out, all right? so. Y'all are going to get the behind the scenes approach here. So those are the classes I learned the most in in, in college. All right, break even analysis. A manufacturing company makes bike computers. Fixed costs are 48,000. Variable costs are 1240 per computer. All right, so um, if the computers are sold at a price of 1740 each, how many bike computers must be manufactured and sold in order for the company to break even? All right, so they're gonna let X be the number sold. All right, I'd rather use something else than X, but we'll use X for that. All right, the total cost is your fixed cost plus your variable cost, All right? The variable cost is, um, in this case, it's $12.40 $12 times the number of items uh, that you're making, okay? So you wanna know uh, where these are, uh, where they break even, the break even point, right? Um, we need to know our, this is our cost formula. We need to have our, our profit, I'll make sure I'm not, profit is cost plus uh, revenue minus cost, right? Your profit, total profit is revenue minus cost. The break even point is where your profit and your costs are the same, right? Yeah. 
All right, so we need an expression for our cost and we need an expression for our revenue. And then we want to set, set them equal to one another, right? So this is where our profit equals cost. So our revenue, I already wrote it right here, is simply the 1740 that we charge for each one times the number that we uh, uh, sell, okay? So we have the cost is 1240 per item plus the fixed cost, like the building the manufacturing plant or whatever, or the materials, right? And then here's your revenue, the sales price times the number. So we need to set these two equal to one another and then solve. So if, now the break even is with, yeah. When the revenue is equal to cost, that's when your profit is zero, hence break even, right? So sorry, I said uh, profit equals cost. It's revenue equals cost. So here's our cost, here's our revenue. If we set these equal to one another, revenue equals cost, we have this, what was our F here? Our C, it's 48,000. Let's go ahead and put that in there. Uh, 48,000. So we set these equal to one another. Our revenue is 1740 X. And then our costs are 48,000 plus 1240 X. All right. So now we just need to solve for X, right? If we want to get all the X's over here, let's subtract 1240 X from both sides. So 1740 minus 1240 is what, five? And now we just need the X by itself. Let's divide both sides by five. So whatever 48,000 divided by five is, okay? Again, I'm rarely interested in the actual last number, right? I'm interested in the math, right? Everybody can use a calculator. Uh, Let's see if we divided it by 10, it would be 4,800, but we're dividing it by five. So it's twice that. So 4,800 times two would be what, 9,600? Huh? <laughs> Arithmetic, right? All right, we're running out of time. Right? You could tell we could always stay up so let's laugh at what. Right? So let's uh, come up with our daily exam. This is exam number three. All right, number one. Let's see, let's do some solve for X. Solve for X. All right, if I have three times X plus two plus X equals two times X plus one. There is one, no fractions. There's X shows up three times. It's not too big of a deal, right? Uh, now let's do um, three halves times X plus two plus X over three equals two thirds times X plus one. Looks a whole lot like the first one, but there's fractions in there, right? First thing I do is get rid of the fractions because fractions suck. I think we can all agree on that, right? And that's it. Get that in by midnight. Any questions? All right. Oh, let me get that's it. All right, see you later. Dylan, Dylan, do you got the exam? Nope, all good. All right, rock and roll. All right, see you later. Bye.